What's up, y'all? Please make sure you watch this entire video all the way to the end and maybe a few times after. Get whatever jewels from this that you can. So I just left the restaurant after waiting 30 minutes for a day to show up and apparently I got stood up. I don't know what to say. Like I'm trying to do everything right to be a gentleman. I brought flowers. I've been consistent talking with this girl for two weeks, trying to get to know what she likes, what she doesn't like. I made plans. I picked the restaurant, the day and the time. You know, I've done everything to be just the kind of guy that would value somebody's time. Like, I just, I'm just looking for my person. I'm just looking for the one that I guess is out there for me. I mean, I want to be somebody's husband someday, father. I'm trying to do everything that's right and I just get stood up. Like, my feelings didn't even matter. Sitting there eating a meal by myself and realizing that nobody even cares. So, this brother, Jonathan, does comedy. He went viral recently for his story um, being stood up. Apparently, he showed up to a restaurant waiting for a young lady that he had agreed to come on a date with, and she didn't show up. And in the video, it looked like the brother started crying, talking about how hard it is to date these days and how basically good guys finish last and he wants a family and, you know, so on and so forth. And I think this is an excellent teaching moment. I know there's some speculation as to whether or not this is real, you know, because he's a comedian, so it could be staged even on his Instagram. He talks about wanting to go viral. I believe he even used viral hashtags, quote unquote, when he posted this, this video. But nevertheless, this is an experience that I've heard happen to multiple people, brothers, sisters. And like I said, whether or not this is real, I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to consider a few things. I'm hoping this in some way is going to apply to women as well, but this is specifically for brothers and some brothers in this space because part of what drives brothers to red pill, to the manosphere, is the idea that we were lied to. The idea that good things are not rewarded, good behaviors are not rewarded. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and he talked about how one of his family members, who's essentially a bum, has kids, and he doesn't, even though he wants kids. And the ultimate gift to a man the ultimate reward for a man is progeny is legacy and the current delegation of women are rewarding the wrong types of men one of the youtube channels that i watch is named psych hacks um, and he talked about this concept of the adored versus the adorer and i think it's an excellent concept to kind of understand the male-female dynamic and some of the counterintuitive truths that we must wrestle with as men as it relates to dating and mating and the whole nine. And basically what he talks about is that in relationships, there are two positions, the adored and the adorer, and that the adored is the person essentially on the pedestal and the adorer is the person worshiping the person on the pedestal. You know, I've talked about how most men baseline put women on a pedestal. We think women are sugar and spice and everything nice. And typically, it's not until something traumatic happens that we realize that that's not the case. But he makes the point that being the adored is actually the harder job. Right? A lot of times we think about it as being the adorer is the harder job because you stand the risk of being denied, being rejected. But he makes a counterintuitive point that being the adored is the harder job because essentially you're, you're in a precarious situation. You're, you're the one who can fall, basically. And contrary to popular belief, women don't actually enjoy that position. And I think this is the first mistake we make as men, particularly men who aren't the future archetype men who didn't get the game from an OG. We default to putting women prematurely 
and undeservedly on a pedestal. Now, Psychax, she makes the point that you do the woman and women in general a favor when you take them off the pedestal and you put them in the adorer position and you take on the responsibility of being the adored. Now, he goes into more detail, but basically, I've learned that women feel safest, women feel the most comfortable when they are seen as a human being, when they're not seen as the bad bitch, when they're not seen as the trophy, this object of desire, like most men see them as, especially if she's attractive. And at the moment you establish and maintain a power dynamic that puts her on top, you've lost. At the moment that you infuse any bit of desperation into your interactions, your dynamic, you've lost. Now, thinking about it from her perspective, it kind of makes sense because where is the fun for her? Where is the excitement for her? Where is the dopamine rush of winning, quote unquote, for her? That's something that the adorer enjoys, not the adored. So essentially, when you allow the woman to be the adorer, you allow her to enjoy all the rewards, whether chemical rewards or the social rewards of winning you. And really the only way to do that is to become him. The most important lesson I've learned, mess with the chick that like you, not the one you like. And I've talked about this a little bit, but uh, whatever him is to you, right? It, it means becoming a successful man. It means becoming a man who's chasing something greater than just a woman or just attention. It means a man who is comfortable being alone. It means a man who's secure enough in himself and secure enough in what he's building to be selective in who he allows to join his proverbial company. You know, part of the reason why Harvard is so hard to get into, part of the reason why Google Meta is so hard to get into is because a lot of people want to get in there. So now these companies, these schools have their pick of the litter and they can be selective in who they award with acceptance. And part of the reason we do what we do as men is to rise the ranks, whatever that means for you in your industry with your interests, and gain the ability to be selective in the quality of women that you accept and not have that spirit of desperation. When you talk to women, they always bring up abundance, whether by saying abundance or in so few words, they idealize men who see the, the, the world as a glass half full, who see the world as a place of opportunity, and men who are desperate for companionship are often seen as men who do not have options. And in this man's case, you know, by looking at him, by kind of gauging his demeanor, he strikes you as somebody who doesn't have options. And obviously that's easier said than done. Some people are blessed with advantages that other people don't have. Some people are tall. Some people are more intelligent. Some people are, have the gift of gab. Some people are more handsome. However, whatever it is that you can do in your industry and with your interest to rise the ranks and to really hone in and get, get in your 10,000 hours, that is the best thing that you can do to become successful with women. You know, the famous saying, you'll lose money chasing women, but you'll never lose women chasing money. So true. My question to you is, when are you gonna learn about my culture? I'll give you an example. You call me fat and ugly in front of people. Asshole. What? I say you were ugly, you were very bad. You really said that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. In my culture, in America, that's rude, that's disrespectful, especially when a woman says that about the man that she's with. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes um, uh, I get in with um, my kid, uh, my friend, or oh, you are clay, you ding ding kum kum. And we, in Vietnam, my culture is uh, not far um, rude. But I don't know how is your country, and now it, you it, 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 we, we could make, like, if we're alone and we're around family, we could make the jokes like that to each other. 
but in front of strangers, I'm a guest here. I am, I am, I seen one other person of my skin complexion here in the whole time I've been here. You're not accustomed to us. So when you say it, it sounds like it's a, it's an attack. You know, one of my issues with the whole Save Yourself movement and the Passport Bro movement, and I've talked about this when they and I, uh, that, that group and I were beefing, but there's this romantic idea of foreign women. There's a romantic idea of, even in women's case, divesting without considering some of the challenges that come along with it, without considering some of the pitfalls of that lifestyle. You know, in this brother's case, he maybe struggled in America dating and he took his business elsewhere. He got an Asian wife and now he's dealing with this. And maybe he thought by leaving the country, by going into another culture, he would be safe or saved. He would have a better time. But as you can see, some of those deep-seated insecurities are still there. And particularly when you consider the reality of what the world is, right? People think of white supremacy, but they don't think about Asian supremacy. They don't think of the fact that China is recolonizing Africa as we speak. And ironically, we think that our salvation is in the arms of a non-black woman. I've had brothers talk to me about how some of the, the women of other cultures are pushed towards black men by their mothers even because these black men are in positions of you know, financial access and the whole nine. But deep down, they just need him for his resources. They don't like him. You're still black. And I'm just hoping that brothers take these things and these nuances into account before they think there's just wholesale salvation in Colombia or in the Dominican or in, in Thailand or in other places. Now, it's different, I think, if you understand the dynamic and you know what it is and you going in, you know, with a clear and realistic understanding. But if you have a fairy tale mindset, be ready for a, for a shock. Now, I, I can speak to Africa. I can't speak to other cultures, but um, African women, for instance, are known to be more domestic than American black women, for instance. But, like I've said before, they have their challenges as well. Don't think for a second that it is just wholesale better on the other side. Sometimes the grass only looks greener because it's astroturf. Also, brothers, please stop crying on camera. Black men, stop crying on camera. Stop listening to this rhetoric about black men need to be more externally, emotionally expressive. It's not true. Express yourself when the time is appropriate, but do not do it publicly. Don't let Hollywood, don't let women convince you that these clown shows of niggas on TV shedding tears to show how in, in touch with our sensitivity that black men are. Don't let that shit fool you. The lesson here is simple, fellas. When you make a woman your priority, you lose. It's counterintuitive. Your mom isn't going to tell you this. Your girl isn't going to tell you this. Your wife isn't going to tell you this. Your sisters aren't going to tell you this. But the reality is when you make a woman your priority, you lose. Women want to follow naturally. Women want to be covered naturally, within reason, obviously. Like I've said, you don't want to neglect her to the point where she's fucking the pool guy. But the truth is, as a man, the only dynamic that is consistently successful with women is a dynamic where you as the man, you could take it or leave it. You have an abundance mindset. You have made yourself attractive, which means physically, which means mentally, which means spiritually, which means financially. And you're moving with comfort. You're moving with ease. And like Brother Polite is going to explain there are three men throughout history who've always had success with women. The teacher, the preacher, and the gangster. These are the best guys that planet Earth has to offer. And I'm not saying you should deal with them. There's the teacher, there's the preacher, and there's the gangster. <clears throat> those, are, those are the ones that women are always going to go for. Then the rest of the guys, they get their women and it always goes to hell. 
your best relationships is going to come out with those guys. So of course, the life path is going to determine what kind of stress you might have to endure. Reason being, and I'm just keeping it a thousand with you. Okay. Women give men the necessary adversity to become more disciplined. And so if the man relinquishes his discipline for the woman, then there's a weak brother. And so the goal is for him to be commissioned by his woman to be greater without her having to do it. Just her being a woman is enough. And in him maintaining his discipline, and I'm going to explain what this means, in him maintaining his discipline, he then makes her better. And then vice versa, they keep making each other greater and better because accountability, of course, is on the man because he has the most women. Now, what does all of this mean? The preacher, he's for God. God is first. So he don't want to be in trouble with God. So even when he get with a woman, the understanding is that, yo, God come first. Not you, Ma. It's, it's my God. Right? And so you got to get with that. So now what's going to happen is she's going to fight with you for position of God, whether she realizes it or not. Because a man in his mind who's like, I'm doing all this in the name of God, there's going to be contradiction with that when your wife need her time. It's a fact. It's not that she's the devil. It's the fact that he's a man of God and she's going to challenge him to deviate from that discipline. Does he keep the discipline? Does he make concessions to his wife? Which is nothing wrong with making concessions like, okay, boo, today, you know, we're going to do that. But overall, if he gives up his discipline, she has no more reason to respect him. Now, we're going to go to the gangster. The gangster going to tell you what? M.O.B. Money over bitches. Yo, I got these other bitches over here, ma, but I fuck with you. You my, you my whiz. You my wife. You know, don't, never mind them bitches over there. That's the gangster. He going to tell you the truth, too. He going to say, look, don't get in the way of me and my bitches and don't get in the way of me and my money because the money come first. This is his mentality. This is gangster's eyes fucking you know, up, right? And she accepts that, but she going to still tug at him. Yo, I know your money come first and all. You spend time with me, though. Oh, boo, let's have some sex. Oh, yo, take me out to the movies. Is he wrong for making concessions to that woman? No, that's his wife. He should sometimes. But the understanding is what makes him different from everyone else. All the niggas going to fuck at her will. All the preachers that's weak and all the, uh, the rest of the brothers in the congregation, they're going to fuck at her will. But the difference between the preacher and the difference between the gangster is how they prioritize. And so it's she's challenge. Like, yo, hold the fuck up. Everybody else want to beat it. Everybody else want to take you to the movies. Do I, these niggas so into their they world that they don't relinquish that hold. He ain't never going to separate from his God. And then you got the conscious brother. He doing the knowledge so much. He always think about building and talking about the universe and everything. And that's it. Yo, Ma, we can't get into that. We need we need to pray. We need to meditate. Let's like these incense. Let's like these. Oh, so this, this is polite. You, know, you want to just have sex. I want to have a ritual. Ritual, nigga. What? We cutting chicken? What the fuck is you talking about? You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, the conscious man, the preacher, uh, the gangster, or the teacher, the preacher, and the gangster, they win favor and get the most women on planet earth because their discipline says, no matter how beautiful you are, no matter what everybody else deals with you, when you come to me, I'm an authentic man. I'm unique and different from everybody else because the shit that niggas go for and the shit that they wanted to do to get your attention, God got my attention. The universe got my attention. Mother nature got my attention. This money got my attention. And so it's a perfect match because when he makes a concession to that woman, she knows this nigga is so into what he into. He must really love me because he's really about that life. So when he give me that, which I'm asking for, you respect it more because, you know, he's not just a savage because you got big titties and a fat ass. If you want to see more of this, please click that like button. It helps tremendously. And share this to somebody you think would gain value from the message and hit that subscribe button as well. Peace out, y'all.